Coach Plari here, CAD Level 3, using Onshape for Vex Robotics. Today we're going to use a CAD model to help us build a drivetrain. Building a drivetrain from a CAD model is going to help us learn CAD because we're going to have to take a really close look at how the CAD model is put together and notice things we might have overlooked otherwise. Plus, people like building. When you're getting started with robotics, you just want to build, you know, put things together um, and kind of skip over CAD, maybe come back to the design stuff later. But if you do it that way, it's going to hurt you in the long run. Starting off with a simple established design is going to set you on the right path because you're going to learn some critical building techniques. So let's look at building a drivetrain from a CAD model. I'm going to start off by using my sample drivetrains label. If you don't have one of these labels, go back to level two and see how you create a label like this. Here's mine, and it's got a list of all the sample drivetrains out there. I'm going to open this one called Basic Four Motor Chassis Room for Intake. And there it is. Um, this is a pretty simple drivetrain. It's direct drive, so the motors are attached directly to the wheels. Um, there's no gears or chains in between. It's a good place to get started because it's simple. Um, this is a pretty sturdy drivetrain. And it also, um, on the front end of it, there's a lot of room in here uh, where you could put an intake. So depending on what year you're building this, um, you might want to have an intake on there. There's other drivetrains in that list that you could build from as well. Um, and you just follow the same steps. But this is a good place to get started, and this is a good example. So we'll take a look at this one. Um, I could build it read-only. I'm going to make a copy of it, though. Having my own copy will give me a little bit of flexibility when we look at the uh, bill of materials list, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, make a copy of that sample drivetrain for yourself. Okay, so now I have my own copy of that drivetrain. So when you're building a robot uh, from instructions, it'll show you step by step what to put together first, put together next. Um, if you're building from a CAD model though, you're not gonna have that. You have to figure out what you should build first and what you should build next. And sometimes there's the order matters and you have to figure that out. Um, so you're gonna have to look at this design and determine what order you wanna build things. I've set up the structure of this CAD model to make it easier for you to go step by step. So of course over here on the instances pane, you know, the, at the top level we have the entire drivetrain with the electronics. There's a sub-assembly called the chassis, the full chassis. And then as you go back through these assemblies that are connected together, there'll be less and less detail on each one. So this one starts off with electronics. This is the full chassis. This is the chassis minus some supports. This is a chassis before the drive sandwiches are all together. Here's the frame by itself. Um, here's a cross support, um, an inside rail, outside rail, and a wheel axle. So you want to start with the smaller parts and put them together first. So first thing you want to work on then is one of these wheel axles. So to get started on it, I would need to go get the parts that I need for this. And let's see, what kind of parts do I need? I could look over here in the instances panel. Um, and it has everything right there. Another way to do that is to go to the Bill of Materials. Um, that's this icon here, or BOM table. And it'll show you all the materials that you'll need. I'm going to add a column here. So I've added the uh, name column, and now I want to uh, reorder them. I'm going to move this one all the way to the left, and that's how I want to see it. So a Bill of Materials is essentially a list of parts. Even when I look at the instances here, it's not intended to be ordered. So I'd, I'd have to kind of count through here to see that there are two of these spacers here. Because this list is short, um, it's easy for me to just kind of count those. But if it were a long list, you'd have trouble with that. Uh, so it's better to open the bill of materials and take a look at this. It would be nice if you could print this off and then go get your part, but there's no option to print it. You can export it to a CSV file and then put that into a spreadsheet and print the spreadsheet. Um, that's a lot of extra steps. The easiest way to do this is to load Onshape on your phone. Um, Onshape will run on your phone, so go ahead and log into Onshape on your phone. Open the bill of materials on your phone, and then go get your parts. Um, and when I look at the bill of materials here, it has a quantity for each item that I need. So it's got the name over here, it's got the quantity, it's got the part number if you need the VEX part number. And in the description of these, it has um, the URL of where you can look at that part um, on the VEX website. Now, in my model, I'm using the official VEX V5 parts library. If you use a model from somewhere else, 
um, they might not have, their bill of materials might not have the part number, description, or name. Um, so it depends where the model was created. But all of mine are going to use the official VEX V5 parts library. And so you will see this information. You'll get a good name and, and the actual part number if you need it. So now I can go get my parts and I can put this together. Putting it together should be pretty simple. I just have an axle. I'm going to slide all these onto the axle and I'm going to create four of these. Now one of the things on here is that um, these, are, um, these are washers. So you have a shaft collar here. You could tighten that down. These washers at the end are going to want to slide off. So you might want to temporarily put a uh, rubber shaft collar on each end of this just so you don't lose your parts as you're building other parts of it. All right, time to start building. Use the instructions to create four axles. Okay, so now I've got my wheel axles. I've got four of these created. I'm going to move over to the next tab and build an outer rail. So I can go to my bill of materials and see what kind of parts I need there. And it looks like I need a low profile bearing. So that is a newer part. So these are, these are new in 2022. So it fits in between a one by three by one C channel without having to shave the ends. If you don't have these new bearings, you'll have to shave a little bit off the end of uh, each of your bearings, or you can put them horizontal. And if you do the horizontal, you'll have to, it'll be a little bit more trouble when you add your motors and maintaining your motors will be a little bit more difficult. But here's all the parts that I need. And then I can just count the holes here and make sure I get these in the right spot. When you're counting holes and counting the lengths of things, you've got these notches here every five. So five, 10, 15, 20. Looks like this one is in the 22nd row of holes. This one's in the fourth. Make sure you get them there. Their screws, the side that the, the screw head is on is important. Um, so there might not be, if you put the nut on this side and the screw end on this side, uh, you might run into trouble down the line. Let's take a look and see here if we would run into trouble. On this particular model, we won't. Sometimes that matters though. There's a plenty of room in here for a nut if you made that mistake. But there is more room inside this channel for the nut. And so it's nice if you have this kind of smoother side where there's going to be parts that are turning in there. So go ahead and build those outside rails. All right, now let's take a look at the inside rail. The inside rail has a shorter C-channel and two motors. So this one is built the same way. Um, we have a bearing plate on the fourth row and on the 22nd row, but the beam itself is a little bit shorter. And then I need to mount these two motors to it. It's easier if you mount the motors ahead of time than trying to mount them afterwards. All right, so we're going to go ahead and build those. Now we're going to build the main cross support for the chassis. Um, this is what it looks like. Again, we can look at the build materials to see what we need. When you're putting together a frame, it's good to get everything loosely connected and then tighten it down later. Okay, now that we have our main cross support, we can put our frame together. So what do we have over here in the frame? We have an inside rail, we have two inside rails, and we have the main cross support, which we've already built and they are connected with a bunch of nuts and bolts. And if we look at our bill of materials, we can find out what they are. Um, they are all going to be the same, which is a 3 8 screw and a nylock nut. Um, so there they are. There's one, two, four, six, eight of those. Again, we don't want to tighten these up all the way. If, for instance, you were to, to build this and tighten these two nuts up all the way, and then these two, by the time you get to this one, it's gonna be off by a tiny bit, and then it's gonna be hard to put things together. So what you wanna do is have just these not fully tightened, get everything in place, get all the nuts and bolts where they're gonna be, and maybe within a half turn of being tightened down all the way. And once you get everything together, then tighten them all down at once. One other thing about building a chassis or anything that's structural support is that you're probably gonna to wanna to use shoulder screws. Shoulder screws make tighter connections and that can prevent racking. So here are two screws. The blue one is not a shoulder screw and the orange one is. And you can see that there's that little bit of metal at the top of the orange one. That will make a tighter joint. So the orange one is on the bottom here and the blue one's on the top. And the blue one can kind of wiggle around the hole a little bit, but the orange one will not. And if you're connecting two structural beams, use shoulder screws and it'll be a much tighter connection. So I mentioned racking. Let me explain what that is. Here's another sample drivetrain with four beams, and it's supposed to come together in a rectangle like it does right here. And so each angle is 90 degrees. If there's racking, those angles won't be 90 degrees anymore. This is really exaggerated. 
but you can see that there's a shaft on the left and that shaft isn't going to go in straight and there's there's going to be a lot of rubbing the wheels are not going to turn smoothly that's not good to prevent racking you could put more screws in there so this one only has uh, one screw at each joint you could put two that would be better um, even better would be two screws that are shoulder screws that would really prevent racking going back to the drive train that we're building here's our frame again and here's our bill of materials for the frame. And if you look at these eight, they're just regular screws instead of shoulder screws. Vex doesn't sell shoulder screws, but you can get them from other sources, including um, robosource.net. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video if you want to get shoulder screws. One other thing to notice about this is that um, by default, the bill of materials will show you a flattened view, which means it will include all the parts, including everything that's inside every one of these sub-assemblies. We've already built these, and so we don't need to get the parts for those, but the flattened view of the BLM will show you all those parts. So it's showing me that there's 16 of these uh, nuts, and they're not all needed at this step. To get the, just what you need at this step, go to the structured view of the BLM, and now it's just giving me the parts for this step, and anything that's part of the inside rail or the main cross support, it's telling you to look at those assemblies to get those parts. All right, back to building for you. Go ahead and build the frame. All right, we're making progress now. Next thing we're gonna do is add the wheels to this. So we're gonna attach the four wheel assemblies that we already built. If you notice on the wheel assembly, there was a short end and a long end on the shaft, and you might have put it in the middle, that's okay. When we add the wheel axles to the assembly we already have together to the frame, you're probably gonna to wanna to loosen these two shaft collars and then slide it in and turn the wheel and make sure it's connecting with the motor. So you're gonna make sure that shaft is just the right length. Um, sometimes you're gonna you're gonna have cut shafts. Make sure that the end of the shaft is smooth so it doesn't have it doesn't have any notches on it from being cut with bolt cutters so that it, it slides into the motor, doesn't get caught on anything. So get all four of these on here. I think I had also suggested you put a rubber shaft collar on both ends so that the washers wouldn't fall off. You're gonna to need to take one of those off. So we're gonna take a rubber shaft collar off on the side we're pushing into the motor. All right, attach the wheels. All right, so now we got all four, four wheels on. We're ready to put the outside rails on. So now we're just going to attach these four outside rail assemblies with these four bolts here. And then we're going to connect this standoff support that goes across on the bottom as well. Once again, it's gonna be easier if you loosely attach the bolts and then tighten them all down at once. Okay, add those outside rails to your robot. Okay, so we got our outer rails on there. We're ready to, uh, to put some more supports in there. All right, add that front and back support and then tighten everything down, fully tight. Once you get your chassis together, we're gonna to do a spin test. So here is an example of a chassis and we're gonna do a spin test on this. Spin test, make sure the wheels are gonna roll freely and it's important to check this on every drivetrain. To do a spin test, we need to make sure the shaft is not engaged with the motor. And so to get it disengaged, we're going to loosen up the shaft collars. All right, so now that I have those loosened, I can pull the shaft out. I wanna pull it out just far enough so that it's no longer engaged. You can feel it's not connecting to the motor, but don't pull it out too far. And so I slid the shaft out a little bit, and now the wheel can spin freely. And here's the spin test. So we're gonna put the we're gonna put the wheel up like this, and give it a spin, and see how it's spinning. It should spin for a few seconds. All right, if it doesn't spin freely, then you've got an issue. Here's one that is not spinning freely. So when I spin it, it, it goes for less than a second before it stops. Something is wrong here. All right, try the spin test on each of the wheels on your robot. So why would a wheel fail a spin test? There's a few different common reasons for it. One common issue is that you have too many spacers and uh, the wheel is just jammed in there between the two C channels. So remove one of the small spacers. The second most common problem that would cause a wheel not to spin is racking, and we already talked about that. Another common issue is that the shaft is bent. Um, what you can do is take the shaft out, lay it on the table, and kind of roll it around on the table and just see if all the sides are flat. If the shaft really is bent, then you should throw it away and get another one. 
It could be that one of your beams is bent too. So if the beam is bent, you could try and bend it back. Um, usually once they get bent like that, you're gonna have to get another one. So hopefully your drivetrain passed the spin test, and if it didn't, you were able to remedy it. It's important that each of the wheels passes the spin test. If one wheel isn't spinning freely, then the robot's gonna pull in the direction of the wheel that's dragging. So your auton routines are not gonna work as well. Of course, your robot won't drive as fast either. It could also stall out the motor. And if one motor on the drivetrain stalls out, it's usually not long before the other starts stalling out. If any wheels didn't pass the spin test, then go back and try and fix them. Now we're getting to the home stretch here. All we have to do is add our electronics. Most CAD models for robotics will not include the wires, and this one does not. To use a driver control program that's built into the brain, attach the right motors to ports 1 and 9 on the brain, and the left to 2 and 10. The radio can go in any other port. All right, now you know how to build a robot from a CAD model. You've been following somebody else's established design, which is a good way to get started. But I know you really want to design your own robot, and that's where CAD's really going to help. To create your own design, you need to start off by knowing how to connect parts. And that's what we're doing in level four. See you there.